Hello and welcome back to another news video with me, Mioni. This time we're looking at the Famitsu interview as part of the media tour and ask some questions with Yoshi P himself. Now, if you're unfamiliar, Famitsu is obviously a Japanese publication and as such, obviously things would be in Japanese. And now, thankfully, we can look at this interview courtesy of Shinitan on the Final Fantasy XIV subreddit community. So thank you ever so much for them for publishing this. A link to that Reddit thread will be in the description of this video. It's quite a a lengthy interview so I'm not really going to beat around the bush too much but this is primarily for people on the move who want to get the latest from Shadowbringers information without perhaps having to scroll through an entire document because if there's anything I've learned over the past couple of years is that not everybody has the time to do so. Either way let's get cracking with these questions and indeed the answers and let's talk a little bit about each one. So they've split this into sections. The first section is actually getting closer to the jobs the players want. And the first question that Famitsu ask is, I'd like to ask about the concept behind the job changes for Shadowbringers. I remember the keywords for the previous expansion, Stormblood, being reducing the things to manage. What was the plan this time? Yoshida responds, first we wanted to cut down the number of hotbars to manage and verse the number of actions. To which Famitsu follow up, serve the numbers themselves? Yoshi says, yes. Part of it was because there were too many role actions, but we had to do another job reorganization at this time in consideration of future developments. Especially for new players, they won't know whether a job is interesting or not if they don't understand its system, so we tried to make everything easier to understand. Famitsu then asks, some players are requesting a Hall of the Veteran that will teach actual skill rotations. Indeed, this was asked in the Final Fantasy XIV Reddit's interview as well, and this time around Famitsu actually got an answer to this. Yoshida responds, the jobs whose skills rotations have become complicated and cryptic over years of build-up have been simplified so that you can simply play them how you want. Up until now, the stronger the job's synergy was, the more tightly you were bound to using certain skills at certain times. But now, our overall concept is to let you enjoy your job more. We've been in service for many years, and we're making a conscious effort to make the jobs resemble what the players want them to look like. Famitsu say, approaching the player's ideals then, and Yoshi responds, I think Monk is the best example. Monk was one of the poster jobs for Stormblood, and many players predicted that it would definitely get Grease Lightning 4, but back then we were reflecting on how jobs were overall too difficult to play in Heavenswood and in the 3.x series, so addressing that became the priority. Famitsu say, in the end, Grease Lightning 4 wasn't added in Stormblood, to which Yoshida responds, We did test it, of course, and then we tried bringing up the skill speed as much as we could. We found that it was too fast for the monk's current system, and basically unplayable. At the time, we were confident in how complete Monk was at a job, so we went the route of burst damage at the cost of speed and made it so that there wouldn't be any extreme variance in how it's played. However, it turned out that it wasn't fun for the players who enjoyed Monk, to which Famitsu say, that's the impression you got from Stormblood then? And Yoshi says, when you're comfortable with the fast speed, then it feels stressful to have to slow down, no matter how much of a DPS increase it is. Even if we do something with the players in mind, if they they don't enjoy it, then it's the wrong choice. We simply adjust each job in a direction that we think the players will want. So, for 5.0, we did have a general concept. We also reviewed each job one by one, asking, is this job okay like this? And balancing them within their role. Fumitsu asks, so you checked that each job would have elements that make it feel good to play? To which Yoshida responds, yes. For Monk, we decided to implement Grease Lightning 4, and that means if it happens to fall off for some reason, it'll take some time to ramp back up to your maximum potential. That would decrease your total damage output drastically, so we made sure to prepare ways to maintain the buff. For example, if a boss leaves a stage, then we want to change the job design in a way where you can adapt it by using a certain ability right before the boss jumps, even if it means breaking your rotation so that you can be back at full speed when the boss comes back. However, now that we've implemented what the players wanted, there's a chance that it will become too fast later on. It's fine for Shadowbringers launch, but when 5.4 rolls around, you'll have a lot more skill speed on your equipment, so it'll become faster regardless of what the players want. Want. Good luck with that, he laughs. 
Famitsu says, I see, so aside from Monk, you also discussed what the players wanted for other jobs, right? Yoshi says, yes, for tanks they currently feel like DPS that have high health and defense, use defensive buffs and hold aggro. If you want to maximize DPS, then you study the fight's timeline, plan where to use defensive buffs, and then simply follow your rotation. I think that's what you want to do the most, so, especially for Paladin, it looks like a beginner-friendly job, but there were a ton of things to do. So we removed the aggro combo to narrow down the combo routes, and in exchange made other changes to allow for player skill to shine through. We're also improving the usability by adding a gap closer to put it in line with the other tanks. You can play around with each tank to see the differences in job design. For Mitsuse, it'll take too long to discuss every job like this, so are there any other noticeable considerations you made? Yoshi replies, there was also the debate over the long often suggested Black Mage raise, to which Famitsu say, because the ever ranged magical DPS, Summoner and Red Mage both have their own raise actions, right? I think there are some that want one for Black Mage and some that don't. Yoshida says, just as an example, what if Black Mage's raise action was based on destructive power and raised the target at 1 HP with the Walking Dead status? But in that case, healers would definitely complain. We thought of several ideas, including ones to increase the penalty for raising, but all of them resulted in no one would use it then, and raising is supposed to be the healer's job in the first place, so this wouldn't be the right direction to go. The same goes for Synergy, so instead of adding those elements to Black Mage, we went for a simpler evolution of the job. Famitsu asks, so there are also things that people wanted which, after discussing, you decided not to implement. Yoshi says, indeed, I think that the people who enjoy playing Black Mage do it because they like putting out high DPS, so even if we gave them raise, they wouldn't proactively use it. If they try to hold swift cast for it, then it makes it hard to swift cast when they need it for movement. The final decision came down to me, but I felt that Black Mage doesn't need raise. Fumitsu say, this also differentiates them to other ranged magical DPS. Yoshida replies, speaking of ranged magical DPS, for Red Mage, since we were already quite familiar with the job before creating it, it was already a very complete job. We felt that one of the keys to its popularity was its high degree of mobility, and we made standard extensions to its kit, such as a new step to its combo following from the Flare and the Holy. Also, since there were people who were afraid of falling off the arena when using Displacement, we added a non-jumping version of the skill that shares its recast timer. However, this version has a lower potency, so you must choose between jumping and taking the risk of falling or playing it safe. Famitsu says, it sounds like you listen to a lot of player feedback. Yoshi says, up until now you had to follow a set rotation to keep up your DPS. For example, even if you didn't want to use your gap closer at the current point in time, it does damage, so you'd have to use it anyway. I wanted to make things more flexible in that regard. The action charging system being added is also because of that. You won't have to use an action right away just because the cooldown finished. You can save a charge until the next phase and use it twice in a row if you want. And the final question for this section, it does feel like your gap closer would often be on cooldown when you needed it. Yoshi says, when adds spawn far away from the boss, you can even use two charges to go there and come back. Instead of using it every time it's up, you can save the charges to minimize damage loss from movement, increasing your overall DPS. That was the general idea. Charged actions will automatically be charged at the start of a duty or when restarting after a wipe, so you won't have to wait for them to charge up beforehand. End quote. And indeed, that's the end of the first section of this interview. And it's quite interesting to see all of the different changes they've made to jobs based on player feedback, especially the Red Mage ability where you have basically displacement, but it doesn't actually throw you backwards. That's really interesting, and I don't know if many people are going to use that, especially since it's a potency loss. People I know at least would rather take that risk, but it'll be interesting to have that in your toolkit. It's really all about making things to sort of answer problems problems, probably not directly as some people would perhaps want with some of the classes, but it does go a long way to see that they are thinking about this and actually reading the forums. So the second section to this interview is on easier to understand and more stress-free. The first question is, when I tried out all of the jobs, I noticed that all of them had access to easy-to-use AoE skills. 
Yoshida says, yes, since Final Fantasy XIV's raids have a lot of impact, there are many people who see it as a raiding game. However, the player patterns we've observed over these six years of service have been incredibly broad. There are many players who don't do normal difficulty raids or extreme primals, but still want elegant tombstones, so they only do instance dungeons at most. We want those players to be able to play any job they want, but some of the job's AoE capabilities were lacking or hard to use, and there are many players who aren't even aware of that to begin with. We wanted to eliminate that issue, so we gave all of the tanks and DPS a two-step AoE combo. When you use the first step, the next step's icon will light up, leading them to try out this combo. Famitsu say, I was a bit surprised that the TP resource was being completely removed in Shadowbringers because many AoE skills have a high TP cost. Yoshi says, you'll be able to use your weapon skills as much as you want, including AoE ones. Instead of forcing cost restrictions onto them and preventing people from doing what they want, we decided to go in the opposite direction and let them have fun with it. I actually wanted to remove TP for Stormblood, but development cost-wise it was hard to fit it in. When we removed the TP cost for Sprint, the eventual removal of TP was also decided at that time. For me to ask, the job adjustments this time fall into two categories, reworks to the mechanics themselves, for example Machinist, Summoner and Bard, and standard evolutions from the 4.x jobs. What was your criteria for deciding between these? Yoshi responds, if I had to narrow it down to one thing, it would be the amount of stress in the job. For Machinist, it ran into a contradiction where the heat gauge was supposed to fill up, but you had to make adjustments so that it wouldn't fill up too much. So we made it that the gauge filling up would be something that you'd be happy about, no matter what job you play. Filling the gauge will feel like a good thing. We also discussed the direction we should take machinist job design in. Since it's a machinist rather than a gunner, we thought it would have more personality if it used a lot of machinery, the kind of stuff young boys would love. We started thinking from scratch on how to apply the concept to the job design in an easy to understand way, and the job mechanics changed as a result of that. For Mitsuse, machinist job design changes a lot with each expansion, huh? And then laughs. To which Yoshida responds, I apologize. It became a new job. However, I want this to be the final iteration. He shows a bitter smile. During the new year, there was an event called Yoshi P Sanpo, where I joined regular players O12S parties. During that, a machinist said to me, Yoshi P, I have high expectations for machinist. And I replied with, don't worry, it's going to change completely. I'm sure they didn't expect it to change this much, giving out another bitter smile. Fumitsu asks, the job actions trailer that was released the other day left a striking impression when the automaton was summoned to fight. Summoner's Firebird also had quite an impact. Yoshida says, for Summoner, we first decided to eliminate the stress of pet management. Eggies take one-fifth of the damage that a player would, but that kind of felt half-baked, like you couldn't tell whether they were getting hit or not, and then they'd get hit by a tank cleave and die. At that point, it was like, maybe we just don't need them to take damage anymore. And for the eggy summoning, since you're summoners, it should be instant, ignoring the fact that you began as an arcanist. We also gave each eggy distinct features so that you'd switch between them to make use of their effects. That's how a pet job should be. Aoife Flow was also separated from Dreadworm Stance and the Summon Bahamut cycle. Yoshida says regaining Aoife Flow was also a stress point, and now we're focusing on the actual act of summoning. Up until now, there was a bit of downtime after summoning Bahamut, so now you can continue on with summoning Firebird, doing a large summon whenever the recast time rolls around. This mechanic change was simply a result of addressing a major cause of stress. Fumitsu asks, was it the same for Bard's changes? Yoshida says, for Bard, there ended up being a huge variance in player skill, between damage reduction skills, personal DPS, and the various timers that needed to be maintained, there were just too many things that you had to pay attention to. Looking at Bard's timeline is confusing. For some people, that might be exactly why they find it satisfying, but I felt that Bard's original concept was a job that could attack whilst moving making it fun and stress-free. We also removed the mandatory compositions that resulted from the Piercing Resistance debuff, eliminating its permanent bond with Dragoon so that you could play it more freely.
For Mitsu say, it did feel like synergy became too much of a fixed thing, especially in high-end raids, to which Yoshi says, I think that synergy is a form of shackles, being forced to do something, criticised if you don't, etc. If people who don't know these things are looked down on by others, then that isn't good for the long-term operation of the game. Rather than forcing the skill gap to be smaller, we want to make things easier to understand, and narrow the scope of the bare minimum that needs to be understood. But of course, we're still making it so that there will be a variation based on player skill, and Bard embodies that sentiment very well. Famitsu follow up with, I see, so the jobs with standard evolutions were based more on afterthoughts, with the main factor for changes being stress. Yoshi says, I'll use Black Mage as an example again. Black Mage has cast times as its stress factor, but in return each of its hits does high damage. In that sense it's balanced, but then there are also situations in fights where there's no way that you can stand around and cast. Being forced to use scave in those situations is the real stress. At level 80, Black Mage will be able to stack Polyglot twice, and they can also use Xenoglossy, which can be considered as an instant cast single target version of Foul. For those times when you're forced to move, you'll be able to reduce your DPS loss by as much as possible using triple cast, two Polyglot stacks, swift cast, and any procs that you have available. This alleviates the stress and allows you to arrange your attacks in your own personal way. I think that this is what player skill is. And the final question for this section, while hearing about those concepts, it seems like this expansion has a lot of daring adjustments. Are you trying to fix the distortions that have cropped up in the past six years in one fell swoop? Yoshi says, I can't deny that there will always be distortions due to development circumstances. I do feel very apologetic to the players who have gotten used to those distortions, but in the long term I think everyone will be happier if we make things the way they were originally supposed to be, and that also makes changes easier. In the event that we make a calculation mistake, a simple adjustment will be enough to fix it. Up until now, it was like if we tampered with one spot, then another spot would break down. I think we'll be able to balance things more directly from now on. And that wraps up that section of this interview. So it's interesting to see how they're focusing on those stress points and... I guess you could call it the simplification of a class. It's all about trying to make things much easier to use, but not necessarily dumb it down too much and let player skill take over, which is generally a good thing in an MMORPG, in my opinion at least. There's a lot of games out there that are criticised of oversimplifying mechanics just for the player base in general, and don't allow for enough player skill anymore. But as a whole, I think that Final Fantasy XIV seems to be heading in a better direction to make the game more enjoyable to play but still show the distinction between those skill levels. The next section is all about Gunbreaker and Dancer's concepts. But for Mitsu ask is Gunbreaker's mechanic of a series of attacks beginning with Gnashing Fang is extremely distinctive. Yoshi says, The Gunblade made its first appearance in Final Fantasy VIII, and I think it's really unique and Final Fantasy-esque. The original bayonet is simply a blade attached to a gun, where you use the gun at long range and the blade at close range. However, Final Fantasy's Gunblade works by pulling the trigger at the time of impact to accelerate the blade's swing and increase the damage it does, which was really exciting for middle schoolers at the time. I felt that this is what made Final Fantasy's Gunblade so appealing, and I thought about how to represent that with Gunbreaker. Gunbreaker's special mechanic is with a powder gauge, and by building it you can unleash the power to use the Gnashing Fang weapon skill, which has a follow-up attack that gives you the feeling of pulling the trigger. The weapon skills that lead off from Gnashing Fang also have follow-up attacks, so it's like continuously pulling the trigger. When you get used to the tempo, it should feel really stylish in battle. To which Famitsu then follow up, it does feel like a fast sequence of three slashes and pulling of the trigger. Yoshida says, since this is our fourth tank, we really needed a playstyle that was different from the other three jobs. It looked simple at first glance, but when you actually play it, you'll see that there's a lot to do. It's hard for me to say, it's a really easy job, so everyone should try it out. Instead, I'll describe it as a job that's as interesting as you make it. For Mitsu ask, this is a very specific question, but earlier it felt like Gunbreaker's Gnashing Fang combo was its highest DPS combo. However, the No Mercy skill, Gunbreaker's self-damage buff, has a cooldown of 60 seconds, while Gnashing Fang was around 34 seconds. Is this an intentional discrepancy? Yoshi says, I didn't explain this because it's complicated. It's an action that uses a new structure, which allows weapon skills and spells to have more separate recasts from the global cooldown. 
Fumitsu say, I see. So for Nashing Fang, it seems that the recast will be changed based on skill speed and that you could bring it down to 30 seconds with the right equipment. Is that what you expect? Yoshida says, it's difficult to explain without trying it out for yourself, so I'll refrain this time. But ultimately, I think Gunbreaker will become a job that experts will like. Fumitsu say, so we might see differences between players based on equipment choice. Yoshida says, I think that there will be a debate before arriving at an ideal rotation. Since it's a tank, as long as you have your tank stance on, you'll gain aggro, and DPS is secondary to that. Even if you don't fixate on DPS, you can still have fun with it. Fumitsu asks, I'd like to ask about Dancer 2. My first impression when trying it out was that there was a lot of chance-based procs, making the rotation fairly complex. It also felt like it'd rely a lot on pot luck. Yoshida says it's been balanced in a way where it won't have that much impact. The theme for Dancer was keeping the tempo, because as the name says, it's a dancer. It's a job that can do various things by using its step actions with a good tempo. It'll probably be a popular job because of its appearance, so we made it so that there wouldn't be an extreme disparity between its upper and lower limits. Also, you say there were a lot of procs, but didn't Red Mage feel that way too at first? To which Famitsu reply, that's true. Yoshi says, but once you understand it, it doesn't feel like that much anymore. The difficulty we're aiming for with Dancer is like a ranged physical DPS version of Red Mage. Fumitsu asks, one concern I have is that you can't attack whilst you're doing steps, which would be a DPS loss. Is the job balanced around buffing your party? Yoshida replies, indeed. In Dancer's case, it's not just synergy, but a buffing job in the original meaning of the term. The steps are the process by which you apply buffs to your allies. To that extent, it's balanced around increasing the DPS of others. Also, we designed it so that it won't be a huge loss if you make a mistake with the steps. These tempo-based actions are very new for Final Fantasy XIV, so I hope you'll enjoy them. To which Fumitsu say, Dancer feels like the addition of an explicit support job. To which Yoshida finally responds, It's similar to a buffer which Final Fantasy XIV didn't have before. If you ask me whether a buffer is mandatory, I'd say it heavily depends on your party members' skill levels. I don't think that Dancer will monopolize the ranged physical DPS slot. End quote. So that's the end of that midsection looking at Gunbreaker and Dancer. It's very interesting how he doesn't think that Dancer will take place as a mandatory role in raids, when in reality, it's, as they've even admitted themselves, it does seem to be quite a important role, especially since they've ripped out a lot of the synergy of pretty much every other job in the game. So it's going to be really interesting to see how many dancers actually turn up in raids, or if they're even needed at all, depending on their DPS loss for that one slot in the raid. It's going to be interesting to see the meta that evolves out of this. In general, though, the class does look quite fun to play, so I think that will be the main focus of most people, but high-end raiding, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. So now we're on to the final section of their interview. I told you it was quite a long one. This one is about why are there no commands in the trust system and the trust system in general. The first question was, the trust system allows us to enter Shadowbringer's main storyline dungeons with NPCs. Why can't we give the NPCs commands? Yoshida responds, this was intentional. Commands are necessary when we want the game to do what the player wants. But this time with the trust system, we wanted it to feel the same as getting matched with other players in Duty Finder. In other words, playing with allies that have their own independent thought processes. So we didn't implement commands. If you add commands on top of an AI, then it can end up being dumber instead. For me to ask, what exactly would happen? Yoshi responds, for example, right now when NPCs are targeted by AoE attacks, they follow an AoE dodging algorithm to calculate where to go and walk in that direction. If you were to give a command while they were walking and they stopped dodging the AoE to obey that command, then the player would think the NPC is stupid. And that said, if they cancel their movement to obey a command, they might not be able to dodge the AoE or even get caught up in another NPC's AoE. Again, again making them seem stupid. When you interrupt the AI's actions, they might not be able to recover well from the interruption. So depending on what the player asked for, the results could be less than stellar. Also, we'd have to set aside some frames before each action to wait for the player's command, so they wouldn't be able to act as smoothly. 
So we decided from the very beginning that we wouldn't be implementing commands, and balanced it such that commands wouldn't be necessary. For Mitsuse, so they're smarter when they're completely autonomous. Yoshida responds, that is true for AIs with personalities. The trust NPCs are always observing their surroundings while determining their actions, so by adjusting to them, players will be able to work together with them. For Mitsuse, I see, so they understand situational changes. Yoshida says, for example, Yoshitola is a special version of a black mage called the Witch Job, of which the editor here puts the name may be different in English. When she's targeted with an AoE while casting, she'll of course cancel the cast to move out of the AoE. If she happens to get targeted by two in a row, then in order to make up for that loss, she'll use triple cast to use burst damage. After losing a certain amount of DPS from having her actions interrupted, she recovers it that way. Each character has their own detailed settings like that, which is why having commands would actually make things stranger. Even when you're playing with real people, you'll run into issues like people not focusing on the same mob. Instead of telling them to switch every time, it's probably more effective to adjust to them. Please think of trust the same way. Trust will adjust to the player, unless they determine that continuing to attack their current target is the better choice. To which Famitsu say, it's like they see something that you can't, and laughs. Yoshida responds, they know how much total DPS is needed to clear a dungeon in a certain amount of time. So if DPS is lost in the middle, they'll try to get back to the target's value as much as they can. In that sense, they really are terrifyingly efficient in a way that the players can't see. You're better off not knowing how they work behind the scenes, he laughs. For Mitsuse, after hearing this much, it does make sense not to have commands in the trust system. Yoshi says, since there aren't commands, we were thorough in developing their personalities to make up for it. For example, if a player is a DPS, Minfilia and Yushtola will never use Limit Break. This is because they think the player, in other words the Warrior of Light, is the leading actor, and so the Warrior of Light should be the one to use it. Although in Yushitola's case, she might just be thinking, it's a DPS loss so someone else can do it, he laughs. As for Alice, her personality has never been one of supporting the main character, but rather walking alongside the main character, and so her train of thought is, defeating the enemies is my contribution to you, and no matter what job the player is, she'll always use the limit break right away when it's available. She won't do anything else until it's been used. If an AoE comes, she'll dodge it and then immediately try to use it again. Just how badly does she want to use it, he laughs. The personalities are a good thing about this system. And Famitsu follows up with two last little questions. Firstly, while they do have a perfect grasp of the situation, it'd be boring if they always acted perfectly. Are there any mistakes programmed into them? To which Yoshida replies, indeed. For Alice, she likes to rush into battle, so she'll often charge in but get hit by an AoE that happens to be there, and then Orianger or Alphano will resurrect her at an incredible speed. Basically, you'll be able to see them as their characters. The trust system isn't just about smart AI, but rather the character acting the way they would personality-wise. Orianger is good. He gives you all of the cards, he laughs. And the final question, now I'm excited to go adventuring with them, the interviewer laughs. It looks like we're out of time, so I'm going to completely ignore the flow of the conversation and ask this as my final question. Will Ultimate Coil of Bahamut and Ultimate Ultimate Weapons be added for Gunbreaker and Dancer? To which Yoshida replies, unfortunately, no with a bitter smile. And there you go. If you've had those questions, you've had them answered in one simple line. But that wraps up the Famitsu interview with Yoshi P in San Francisco. This was a fantastic interview, probably one of the best we've seen so far out of the whole lot. Personally, I feel that there's far too much emphasis on things that don't necessarily matter, whereas this actually looked at, you know, the actual gameplay mechanics, the reasons for changes for jobs. It's quite good. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching it as much as I have reading it to you. Either way, thank you kindly for watching. There is a link, as always, in the description of videos like this one today. Thank you all kindly for watching, and I'll see you all next time.